Welcome to our lecture on Earth's history. We're going to start off today's lesson with a controversial topic. The formation of our universe, solar system, and Earth itself. I did not realize just how controversial it was until I was doing some postgraduate work, uh, taking some seminars at the Museum of Natural History. And as it turns out, there's uh, quite a spirited debate going on amongst creation, quote unquote, science and uh, more modern scientific thinking. Uh, I'd like to uh, point out to you uh, that science is always changing. Uh, it's based on evidence and then you change your theories in accordance with new evidence. So uh, when I talk about James Usher, who was a very respected scholar of the Bible, he was also an archbishop, uh, he came up with something uh, we would call dogma, coming from tradition and not changing. So his uh, theories of catastropheism, meaning that the earth was shaped by sudden biblical events and then remained unchanged between these events, would be more dogmatic than uh, scientific. Uh, he used Genesis to uh, date the age of the earth, and he came up with a date, 4004 BC, uh, using the age of the characters in the genealogy section, and then adding seven days for the creation. And his thoughts were taught and accepted for quite a while. Hutton, who's considered the father of geology, we spoke about him in a previous lecture, uh, he came up with the uh, uniformitarianism, or published it, saying that there's no vestige of a beginning or no end in sight, that the Earth's got a vast history, and it's shaped by slow changes that are occurring today. Today, though, uh, we look at kind of a hybrid of the two, neo-catastrophism, where we recognize sudden events that shape the earth, and we also recognize slow, gradual changes that occur constantly. So uh, today's geologist uses evidences to shape modern theory. So today, the evidence points to an Earth, or should I say a universe, nearly 4 billion years old, 14 billion years old. Uh, started with what was jokingly referred to as the Big Bang. Uh, if you think of Einstein's E equals MC square, that theory of relativity links energy with matter. So energy formed matter. Over that time, matter condenses, forming galaxies, stars, solar systems. We'll look at that in the next slide. The next slide shows you an image of what current scientific neo-catastrophism uh, points to. You have the Big Bang or the conversion of energy to matter. Early matter consists of hydrogen, which fuses to helium. That occurs in a star. So these huge nebula, these huge gas clouds condense. When critical mass is met, we have fusion, the formation of larger elements. That occurs in stars. Uh, around the stars, because of the gravity, you have accretion and condensation occurring. That's how planets form. You can see our planet very early in its history had a large collision, which we believe is how the moon formed. So this illustration depicts various sequence in the formation of our galaxy, our solar system, and finally our planet. Now, Earth's early atmosphere was lacking oxygen. 
we can tell that because the rocks do not show oxidation. We also think that there's a lot of water vapor which escaped from our planet, condensed, rained, condensed, rained, eventually filled stable oceans. Carbon dioxide was prevalent in the atmosphere. About 3.5 billion years ago, we see our first oxidation pointing to the first oxygen. Looking in the fossil record, we also see the first evidence of microscopic life. So we postulate photosynthesizing bacteria begin to least, uh, release oxygen. This increases steadily over time, allowing for an ozone layer and multi-celled life eventually. Uh, and again, the oceans stabilize, moderating climate, absorbing excess carbon dioxide, weathering and erosion occurs, we have weather. So uh, this is what neocatastrophism points to how the primitive earth got to today, what we find today. When we look at geologic time, early geologists only had relative dating. There's several laws that we're gonna go through on how you order events. Marie, uh, Marie Curie finds radiation, discovers it, works with it. Other scientists refine it, and eventually we can manipulate that atomic clock to do many things. One of them is put specific dates to events or samples using half-lives. So we'll start off with relative dating, and there you have a sequence strata of sedimentary rocks. They are deposited horizontally, so that's our first law, original horizontally, parallel horizontal layers. Superposition states that the oldest are on the bottom and the youngest are on top. So our first two laws just are the basics on how we sequence events, sequence rock layers. So using those first two laws, we can look at the Grand Canyon, a cross section, and we can say that the oldest are toward the bottom of the canyon and the youngest are up on top. We don't have any disturbances like faulting and folding in this image, which complicate things, but there's also laws that help us order those as well. Cross-cutting relationships is one such law. You have your layers and then something cuts through them an igneous intrusion in this case called the dike. One of the more famous ones is in the Grand Tetons. You can see those hatches on the long side of the dike that indicates contact metamorphism, which we discussed last rock unit. Uh, the hot magma singes the rocks, metamorphosizing them. So now you have the dike, which is younger than the rock layers that it is cross-cutting, that is Law of cross-cutting. So when we put the two together, we can look at this image. You can see cross-cutting igneous rocks. You can see the youngest rock layer up top, the sandstone, superposition. You can see the oldest layer, limestone, superposition. The limestone has been warped. You can also see igneous intrusions and you know which one is older and which one is younger using cross-cutting. Faulting and folding further change the rock record. You can see here we have compressional forces causing the folding of rocks, kind of looks like lasagna on the sides. When it's mowing up, the peaks are called anticlines, the valleys are called synclines. So when you look at B, you have an anticline on top and a syncline below. Uh, you can also see that we have a fault between C and D. And if you look down D, you have an igneous inclusion or igneous intrusion number four, which you can use cross cutting to order the events. So here you can see that we have layer one, original, layer two, then we have warping, then 
we have some faulting and folding. Well, no, no, we have uh, layer three deposited. Then we have the faulting and folding, which goes all the way through. Now, the law of inclusion states the inclusion has to be older than the rock as it forms because it fell in the cooling rock. So the clasts are older than the rock itself. They're called clasts. Now, unconformity is a break in the rock record through erosion or uplift, subsidence, deposition. All these geological processes cause unconformities. So, deposition, uplifting, tilting, you have all these unconformities which change superposition. You can still use the laws, knowing whether it's a syncline or an anticline, to relatively date what occurs. Faunal succession or fossil records is helpful when looking at sedimentary rocks. Our early geologic time scales are based on faunal succession. We use these fossils to define the eras of Earth's history. The Precambrian era, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic are all based on fossils, the traditional eras. We further subdivided the Precambrian uh, based on geologic events. We've also added dates based on absolute dating processes. So you can use fossils present to postulate events, environments, between rock layers, as shown in this illustration here. An index fossil is a fossil that exists and lived for a period of time, so you can tell how old that rock is if that fossil is present. So our USGS has a list of index fossils, and they are used to put an exact date on a rock or a formation is our USGS index fossils. You can see the age of recent life, the Cenozoic, also referred to as the age of mammals, the pectin gibbous, which is the calico scallop, uh, very common on our beaches today, and it hasn't been around very long, so if you can find any rocks with the pectin gibbous, you know that it's from the quaternary period of geologic time. If you go to the bottom and you see that trilobite, if you find any rocks with trilobites, you know it's from the Cambrian period of the Paleozoic. So using these index fossils, you can place the age of a rock. So correlation is used, in this case, you know, the Grand Canyon, matching the rock layers, the fossils to correlate geologic time. We've used correlation to help prove plate tectonics when we're looking at similar formations across the ocean as well. So it's not just small scale like the Grand Canyon, it can be large scale like uh, the separation of South America and Africa or the separation of Antarctica. Uh, we can correlate rocks, we can correlate fossils, we can correlate geologic formations like mountain ranges, to help piece together Earth's past. Correlation was used to uh, determine the KT boundary. KT boundary is the extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs and ushered in the Cenozoic era. Uh, so you can look for volcanic ash, worldwide meteorite debris, worldwide, and see large events by correlating uh, the rock formations around the world. So here, in this image, you can see a layer of volcanic ash 
worldwide, dating 65 million years before present. A layer of iridium dust. Iridium is an element common in asteroids and meteorites, uncommon on Earth, layer straight across the planet. So it looks like we had an impact 65 million years ago, correlating with the dust, correlating with the extinction of the dinosaurs, the loss of the fossil record, a mass extinction. And we're correlating all these events to come up with a theory on how it occurred and what occurred. The current thinking thinks that the uh, Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan of Mexico, uh, there's a crater there, meteorite impact, uh, showing 65 million years, ended the uh, era, the Mesozoic era. So we can interpret geologic events, geologic sequences by using our laws. Here, you can see that the igneous intrusion cuts through the limestone, so it's younger, but it does not cut through the shale. The shale was laid on top of it and there's no contact metamorphism. So you can order geologic past events by studying the rock record. Here, you can see that this is uneven erosion. Different rocks erode at different paces. You can also see that's part of an anticline syncline. So you would say D is older because that would be one of the legs of the anticline. So although there is unconformity, you can still use our relationships and knowledge of earth science to sequence events. And again here, you can see that the fault predates the igneous intrusion because the igneous intrusion cuts through the fault undisturbed. So using these geologic laws help you interpret the geologic past. Now absolute age uses radioactive decay to put a date, an approximate date on an artifact, a rock, an event, uh, and it allowed us to fill in the geologic time scale with millions of years or even billions of years before present. We call that radiometric dating. Uh, there's more than 40 techniques now, and every time we discover new techniques, we become more and more accurate uh, with the geologic ages and geologic time. So early on, there was a lot of mistakes, and as we've refined the process, we've become uh, far more accurate. We use many different methods before a date is put on something. We, we base it on the half-life. Half, uh, see, isotopes are unstable, and they decay to a more stable daughter atom. And you can use the ratio of isotope to stable daughter atom to determine how old the sample is using the half-lives. Something like carbon-14 only works for recent events, wouldn't work for dinosaurs 65 million years ago. We would have to choose the proper isotope to match the age. And then if half of it's gone, you know it has one half-life. If 75%, you know it's had two half-lives, so on and so forth. Input into a computer, used to be an old curve, but now input into a computer, come up with the approximate age, check it with several different methods to make sure you're accurate, and then you publish your findings for peer review. Carbon-14 is the most common. It's used for human artifacts because us humans haven't been around for very, very long. But when you go back into the stretches of geologic time, radiocarbon dating won't go back that far because it only has a half-life of 5,730 years. So all this 
goes into the modern geologic time scale. Geologic time scales have been around a long time. Uh, they predate putting the dates in where, you know, we just have a geologic time scale based on the fossil record. And then dates have been put in uh, as we gather more evidence. So this Precambrian takes up seven eighths of Earth's history. It has been further divided into various eons based on events. You can see the Archean to Proterozoic break at 2.5 billion years. That's the discovery of microfossils. That 2.5, you move into the Proterozoic, Zoic animal, uh, we cross a threshold. So each one's crossing a threshold. The Paleozoic comes in with what we call the Cambrian explosion of life, the development of multi-celled widespread life. You can see it in small assemblages leading up there and then life takes off. Uh, the great dying ushered in the Mesozoic. So these are bookended by major events. And then the Cenozoic was ushered in by the KT meteorite impact as we used as an example of correlation. So here's the early fossils, 3.5 bill in years is when we see the first evidence, but we didn't cross a threshold. We didn't have enough oxygen in the environment for uh, the takeoff. This was the precursor to an oxic environment, an oxygen rich environment, I should say. Uh, this is a stomatolite chain of photosynthetic bacteria. Stomatolites do exist, bacterial reefs. So they're the oldest form of life. You can see uh, the cross sections below of an ancient reef, bands from oxidation, so we know that they're producing oxygen. The Gunflint Formation is a, a famous Precambrian formation that we find. Uh, some of the oldest known fossils, uh, we see early oxidation. Uh, so we have a few fossil assemblages, as they're called, that give us clues to our past. The Ediacarian assemblage occurs in Russia and Australia. We see the first multi-celled life starting to uh, evolve. We're still in the Precambrian, so we haven't crossed into the Cambrian explosion into the Paleozoic, but we're starting to see multi-celled life. Another uh, Edia carrion assemblage, you can see primitive life forms in the fossil record, microfossils. Some of them may be a little larger, a couple inches in, in diameter, but very simple life. When we entered the Phanerozoic Eon, Paleozoic Era, we see an explosion of life called the Cambrian Explosion. That's the first period of the Paleozoic. We see the proliferation of all of the animal taxa in the oceans. It's also referred to as the Age of Invertebrates. You can see in the illustration, invertebrates uh, make up our early life. And then the age of fishes is, is loosely Devonian time. The age of amphibians is also Pennsylvania and Mississippian periods. That's the great coal forests. So most of our land was swamp. The age of reptiles is referred to as the Mesozoic. And then the age of mammals, the Cenozoic. So early geologic time scales uh, just use the fossils. And then modern geologic time scales have a more accurate chronology to them. So the major events in the Paleozoic ushered in by the uh, explosion. We have first vertebrates all during the Cambrian time. Uh, first land plants and then first land animals also. So land starting to be colonized. Reptiles develop. Largest mass extinction ends it. This mass extinction is shown uh, over 90% of species are wiped off. 
we look at a lot of flood basalts, a lot of volcanic activity, huge swings in climate and carbon dioxide, uh, and it appears to be environmental. So the Cambrian explosion uh, opens up our new era, pre-Cambrian, the explosion of life. We call that early Cambrian, the age of invertebrates. Trilobites, brachiopods, they are the dominant life. We do have coral in the seas, but it's different. Coral's gone extinct several times. The rugos and the tabulate, both are now extinct. We find a huge fossil assemblage showing Middle Cambrian time uh, called the Burgess Shale. It was discovered in 1909 in Canada. Still the most complete window we have into Cambrian time. Uh, somehow, soft parts were preserved. Very rare that you get soft parts preserved. Uh, in this shale, which is mud, shale's mud, remember, sedimentary rock, mud. Uh, we have worms, tentacles, all these soft parts that usually decay, remarkably preserved. These are some Burgess shale assemblage fossils. The Devonian is referred to as the age of fish because fish were the apex life. The lobe fin fishes are the precursors to amphibian. Sharks are present. Early fish. The first vertebrates haul out of the water. And then we enter the age of amphibians. As I mentioned, this uh, Carboniferous, it's also called Mississippi and Pennsylvanian, huge coal forests. Carboniferous refers to the coal uh, period of Earth's history where much of Earth was a swamp. Amphibians were the first vertebrates to reach land. They still were tied to these swamps. They needed the water. So reptiles, you know, scaly skin, hard shell eggs, can live in deserts. Amphibians, no, but they were perfectly suited to the environment at the time. The age of amphibians then, uh, also known as the coal age, Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. There's lots of coal deposits in Mississippi and Pennsylvania, hence the term. Uh, and those are some examples of the amphibians. Now, the PT boundary, also called the Great Dying, was the largest mass extinction. 95% of marine species disappeared. It appears to be environmental. Ushers in the Mesozoic, meaning middle animals, also referred to as the age of reptiles. We have three time periods, Tri Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. So you can see our first dinosaurs. This is called the age of dinosaurs, the age of reptiles. Uh, Pangaea breaks up, meaning the Atlantic Ocean is forming. Early mammals come from reptiles. Early birds come from reptiles. First flowering plants in the Cretaceous. Now these survive. They are generalists. They survive the mass extinction that ends the Cretaceous. So dinosaurs evolved, diverse, and dominate in the age of reptiles. Birds and mammals slip through the PT extinction, KT extinction, pardon me, KT. The reptiles, those I mentioned, amniotic egg, further colonized land, and this is uh, contributed to their dominance. You can see dinosaurs capture the imagination and they thrived. You have the uh, plant-eating dinosaurs up top, uh, four-legged creatures, and then you have the raptor-like uh, meat-eaters on the bottom, bipeds. Other reptiles that existed, pterosaurs, the flying dinosaurs, ichthyosaurs, swimming dinosaurs, pleosaurs, 
Nessie, Nessie uh, is rumored to be a living pleosaur. We've all heard of the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, been shown to be a hoax, but it did capture the imagination for decades. The angiosperm is one of the most important things to come out, this flowering plant that produces fruit. This allowed it to survive the mass extinction. This fruit helps disperse, having animals eat it. The seeds have proteins in them. So these are the apex plants. The birds, there's Archaeopteryx, the uh, most famous cross between the reptile and the bird, a missing link, if you will. You can see the reptilian tail, the reptilian skull, the reptilian claws, the avian feathers. So you have both bird and reptile characteristics. Mammals, also linked to reptiles. And of course, we mentioned the KT boundary, uh, the most famous mass extinction, but not, not the largest, not as big as the Great Dying, 75% or so species perished. Uh, the evidence points to that Chicxulub crater. An alternate theory, of course, smoking. Now, the Cenozoic era, age of mammals, it's only been 65 million years, which to us seems like a lot, but is the blink of a geologic eye when you're looking at billions. So here's a section of the geologic time scale showing the uh, era periods We call it the age of mammals because these small mammals crossed that mass extinction border. And now, without the larger size competition from the dinosaurs, we're at a great evolutionary advantage and thrived. Monotremes are the egg-laying mammals. They are humble beginnings. The representatives today, the platypus and the echidna, the spiny anteater, uh, they lay eggs. So this is one of those evolutionary missing links. Marsupials give incomplete birth, incomplete development, and then the development continues in the pouch. Placentals give birth to a completed individual, even though humans you know, were trapped by a big head, our bones aren't always formed, but we've kind of uh, aren't part of that natural world, whereas a deer, it's born and it runs within minutes because it doesn't want to get eaten. And then there was a multi-tubularicate that is now extinct. We also have a period in our history where megafauna, dominated, giant, woolly mammoths, rhin uh, rhinoceroses, sloth, saber-toothed tigers. Uh, the megafauna's gone extinct at the end of the last ice age, could be environmental. Other theories show humans, humans out-competed them, out overhunted. Uh, so probably a combination of all of the above, as uh, usually is the case. So humans have been linked to extinction in the past, and now we're linked to present extinction. The number one cause of extinction today is habitat destruction. So we are getting our new geologic epic based on human change, human change. A few of our uh, Bigger impacts, the dodo. The dodo was flightless and was clubbed to death uh, by human ignorance. 
they, they called them the dodo because they were stupid, they didn't run away. So here's uh, one case where humans have caused an extinction. Another case is the stellar sea cow, where humans have caused a needless extinction. These uh, manatee type, they were actually dugongs, the fork tail and the pure marine existence makes them a dugong and not a manatee. Manatees are uh, estuary creatures and they have a paddle for a tail. Uh, but humans uh, needlessly killed them as well, slaughtered them to extinction. So uh, we're going to conclude with these mass extinctions. They generally bookend our geologic time. It's the fate of most species. 99% of species become extinct. Here is a graph of the mass extinctions. You can see we've had five mass extinctions in the past. There's always a background extinction, natural extinction. Are we entering that sixth period of mass extinction? Uh, time will tell. Could be climate change, could be forest destruction, habitat destruction, or we could become more conservation-minded and skirt tragedy. Uh, time will tell. I hope you enjoyed our lecture. Have a great day.